In this video, I'm gonna tell you about my experience as a jazz musician in the modern era, okay? Obviously, a lot has changed since the heyday of jazz, so I just wanna give some perspective. I wanna talk about my education, I wanna talk about my professional experience, and ultimately, I wanna talk about how I turned jazz musicianship into an actual career. <laughs> So this is gonna be a long one because I'm literally gonna tell you my entire musical history from the very start up until the present day. So buckle up, dude, and prepare for a massive download. So it all started in Portland, Maine at a jazz club called Blue, right? I was 15, it was 2007, the crisis was just about to hit, and I've been studying jazz for two years under the guidance of the local legend, Pat Keen, yes. The very same Pat Keen, who was the mastering engineer for all three GSM albums. So by 2007, Pat had equipped me with the knowledge that a competent jazz musician is expected to have. And there was something about Pat and his approach to music that just resonated with me on a cosmically deep level. And that cosmic resonance comes back, and we're going to see that later in the story many times. But I literally remember just one day, probably about six months after I started with Pat, where I just woke up and was like, I'm gonna go hard with this. And the piece that specifically inspired me to just take it seriously was Jezu, Joy of Man's Desiring, the Bach piece, right? Now, before Pat brought me this piece, I was just kind of casually strolling along in the garden of music, really in no rush to see all that could be seen but there was something about that piece that just turned it on for me. I was committed to mastering it, obviously on a performance level, but I also wanted to understand why it was so magnificent. Now, Pat saw that musical curiosity right when it happened. He did not miss a beat, and he knew that my thirst was not for classical performance, but it was the thirst for musical fluency. And I do have to credit Pat with starting that fire that began blazing inside of me and continues to blaze on to this very moment. Pat was just that classic masterful teacher who was always 10 steps ahead of you and he was laying out the path that he knew you needed to walk. And he was very empathetic to every student and that just meant so much to me. It literally sent me in the direction that I continue to follow to this very day. So once that switch flipped with Jezu Joy of Man's Desiring, I became that typical five hours a day neurotic practicing kid who literally refused to give any amount of attention to anything that wasn't music, right? Classic. So the excessive practice began just about a year before I entered my freshman year of high school. And I was highly motivated to up my skills before entering high school because the particular high school that I attended, South Portland High School, was legendary for its jazz ensemble. That jazz ensemble was revered throughout New England as it had won multiple titles at the Berkeley Jazz Festival and consistently dominated at high school jazz competitions all over the Northeast. Yeah, welcome to America where you have jazz competitions for high school students. Now, I wanted to be in the band, of course, and the thing is, the band director was none other than the absolutely notorious Craig Skeffington, okay? Notorious for being an aggressive hard ass, okay? Holding his students to like an impossibly high standard, but I mean, that's what it takes to dominate. Literally the type of guy who ignored everything except for the music, and you know, I was also that type of guy, so I was like, let's go. And I was a member of the jazz ensemble in my very first year of high school. And that first year was already pretty freaking monstrous and pivotal in my development as a jazz musician. I was fortunate to have two absolutely phenomenal legends in the band when I was a freshman. They were both seniors. I'm talking about Neil Perlman. Yeah, literally that Neil Perlman, the Scottish fusion authority, okay? And also Owen Kiter, who honestly, I don't really know what happened to him, but he was an absolute legend, never forget. So I got to spend a lot of time with those two guys because the three of us, 
got into the Allstate Jazz Festival and we got to go and I got to hang out with the older kids and they gave me so much insight. I literally learned infinity from them and to this day, Neil is a close friend. Every so often I get to play with him and it's just freaking cosmic every time. Okay, moving along to sophomore year here, okay? 2007, right? Literally during the crisis, okay? Was when I actually met my maker, okay? This is the story. So Wayne Bergeron, okay? If you know Wayne Bergeron, you know. Wayne Bergeron came to the high school as a guest performer with our jazz ensemble, okay? So the band was preparing for his arrival by learning Gordon Goodwin Big Fat Band arrangements, okay? One rehearsal in early October, right? So, you know, financial system on the brink of absolute unholy calamity. This guy who looks like a Stephen King character shows up to our rehearsal, literally orange ringlets down to his waist, okay, tied back into a ponytail, but it literally looked like the tail of an actual horse that had red hair, okay, this is the guy who walked into our rehearsal, literally wearing all black with like cowboy boots, like this guy, like who is this guy? He was obviously carrying an instrumental case. I was like, that's probably an alto sax, right? <laughs> I don't know why I thought that, but I distinctly remember thinking that's definitely an alto sax. Turned out it was a trumpet, okay? So he shook hands with Skeffington and I realized this guy was a former student, right? I put it together pretty quickly. Skeffington probably had secretly invited him to come play the Wayne Bergeron part during our rehearsals, right? Because that Wayne Bergeron was like unreasonably absurd for a high school student to play. So, you know, during rehearsals, I was actually playing in the solo section where the trumpet solo was supposed to be. So then I quickly connected the dots that this guy with the red hair was about to play the Wayne Bergeron solo. So I was gonna literally compare him to Wayne Bergeron right then and there. And that's like, okay, so the implications are just unraveling in my mind right here. So the guy goes back up into the trumpet section and uh... All I can say is what Skeffington said, which was buy a f ticket next time because the band obviously just missed all the cues to come in after the solo, right? Due to the undeniable fact that this red haired maniac just set the whole place on absolute fire. And this was none other than the New England trumpet icon, Mark Tipton, okay? To this day, possibly the most obscene trumpet player I have ever known. The chops of Wayne Bergeron times infinity only wielded with the deeply woven musicality of someone who grew up on the jagged coast of Maine, swimming the frigid and salty waters of Casco Bay. So the next time I saw Mark was a couple weeks later at the Wayne Bergeron Jazz Ensemble concert, right? After the show, I got to talk to Mark and he actually invited me to come play some tunes with him sometime, right? Just duo, right? Like learning, like giving back to the community. Good old Mark Tipton, always a good guy, you know? And sure enough, I followed up with him and we ended up playing some duo at his place a few weeks later and we did hit it off musically, okay? And Mark actually did ask me if I wanted to play in his quartet for some shows at Blue. So this was massive, obviously, right? I said, you know, met my maker, Mark Tipton, right? This is massive because up until this point, the only live playing I had done was at church or with my high school's jazz ensemble, so I had not done any actual professional live playing at this point at the tender age of 15. But I did have full confidence. I was a pretty confident guy at that point because I knew that nobody else, like within a hundred mile radius, was probably practicing music to the level that I was at that age. So yeah, I did have a lot of confidence for that reason. I also knew that this was destiny playing out, right? So we had some rehearsals, good old Mark Tipton, making sure the band's tight as hell before you hit the stage. And we played some of Mark's classic deep cut original bangers. I'll never forget Voyage of the Star Whale, okay? And very early on, that gave me critical exposure to how to integrate the jazz mentality into composition and how it expands much farther than just, you know, lead sheets. It can be very, very complex. And, you know, if you've been watching my videos, you know what I'm talking about. Like the rhythmic frameworks were implanted very early on from this experience with Mark Tipton. So we had the performance and that absolutely solidified my identity to the core as a jazz musician. And thereafter, I lived and breathed jazz. I was fully dedicated to becoming a true master of this art form. So let's provide a little context to what was going on leading up to this performance with Mark Tipton in terms of like my musical interests. 
So right before I started like going all in on jazz, my favorite albums were The System Has Failed, Countdown to Extinction, and Rust in Peace. Those were my three favorite albums. Marty Friedman was my favorite guitar player, and I could always hear from early on that his harmonic awareness was much more advanced than his contemporaries. I immediately connected the notion of playing chord changes to what Marty Friedman was doing. So very early on in my musical development, I saw the applicability of the jazz mentality to all styles of music. My logic was that if I could master jazz or the art of playing through chord changes, then I could play and compose incredible solos in any context, just like Marty Friedman, right? And honestly, that's something that proves to be true every day of my life, right? And of course, the rock never left me, right? You'll see what happens, you'll see. So sophomore year continued on to be absolutely pivotal because I met some crucial characters in the story. One in particular was the undisputed high school champion of the upright bass, Dominic Spraga. undisputed because he actually was selected for the Grammy Jazz Ensemble his junior year and senior year of high school so the Grammy Jazz Ensemble is like the national all-state band so like literally the best high school musicians in the whole country are the ones who get selected for this and he was selected for it twice good old Dom Spraga from small town Maine legend and not only that this guy actually won a freaking downbeat award also in his senior year of high school for outstanding performance like what Dom like look it up like straight up look up Dom Spraga absolute legend he went on to be the bassist in the U.S. Air Force Band which is like you know in terms of like being a professional jazz musician that's probably like the highest paying job you could actually get with like benefits and stuff and like you know actually going to bed at a reasonable hour I love Dom congrats he worked so hard for that man he was so laser focused and committed he wanted to be in that U.S. Air Force Band since he was literally like 14. He was like, this is my only option. And he got there and I love it. Huge credit to Dom. And he really kept my musicality at a very, very, very high standard very early on. So Dom and I met because we were both in this jazz quintet that performed at cocktail parties and restaurants throughout Southern Maine between 2008, 2010, literally my first job, you know, just playing jazz standards in the corner of a tourist trap with Dom Spraga, epic. So around the spring of 2008, Dom and I started a trio with the ultimate deep cut drummer turned producer from Cape Elizabeth, Brandon Meager. Never forget, that trio was responsible for some of my best early performances. I felt like I actualized my voice as a musician with those guys. We were playing original tunes by this point, like fully integrated jazz mentality, Radiohead meets Bad Plus style bangers. Unfortunately, the few live recordings that existed, I couldn't find them. I think they're probably lost in time, but I remember the music was absolutely crushing with those guys, and I gained a lot of confidence playing with them. So junior year, that was the year of Berkeley. okay? So Skeffington decided the band was ready to go to the Berkeley Jazz Festival, and you know he was only going to take us if he was absolutely a thousand percent certain bet the farm that we would win the festival. And obviously, we won the festival. The Berkeley Freakin' Jazz Festival of 2009, Southbourne High School, first place champions. And I was awarded the Distinguished Musicianship Award at the festival. And that's actually literally the highest award that they give. And that came with a full scholarship to the Berkeley Five Week Summer Performance Program. So obviously I went to the Berkeley Five Week Summer Performance Program and that's where I met Tim Miller. Yes, the Tim Miller who plays on the Pliny record and is literally just the ultimate example of the fully actualized master. He was my one-on-one -on -one instructor for the duration of that five week program, man. And Tim Miller was the one who showed me the method that I still teach to this day which is the method of composing lines through chord changes in order to see all the possible ways that melody can relate to harmony. So from there, using these studies to build out technique while always having a conscious awareness of the underlying theory, easily one of the most effective methods I have come across for the advancing guitarist, Tim Miller, absolute legend of the story here. So 
Then it's senior year, right? Last year of high school, that's the year of the college auditions, right? By this point, I knew without a shadow of a doubt I was going to music school. And to prepare for these auditions, Pat actually recommended that I begin studying with the direct Lenny Bro descendant, Bob Thompson, right? Descendant of Lenny Bro by guitar knowledge, not by blood. But Lenny Bro lived in Maine from 1979 and 1980, and Bob Thompson was nice enough to let Lenny Bro crash with him for all that time, right? In exchange for like the most valuable guitar knowledge imaginable, right? So studying with Bob was absolutely game changer. It refined all of my knowledge and gave me systems that I still use to this day in my performance and in my teaching. I'm talking about Fat Shapes. That goes to straight Lenny Bro, like Fat Shapes directly from Lenny Bro via Bob Thompson to me. Fat Shapes are from Lenny Bro, like don't forget it. Right? And I mean, the Fat Shape system is, you know, go check out the school if you wanna learn about that. But I mean, that is the way that I still organize harmony in my mind and the elegance of that system is literally heart-wrenching. It's just like, I know the pieces fit. Like, it's crazy. So Bob told me that McGill University in Montreal was the place to be, and I believed. I absolutely believed. I don't know why I believed, but I just completely believed that everything Bob told me was the absolute God honest truth. And so when he told me that McGill was the place, I was like, I am going there. So of course, I still applied to all the classic music schools, you know, like literally like Juilliard, Manhattan School of Music, Eastman, like New England Conservatory, Berkeley, McGill, right? It was like the classics. But I was like, I'm going to McGill. I just knew it. When I came to McGill for my audition in February of 2010, I literally instantly, for some reason, fell deeply in love with the city of Montreal. I don't understand how that happened because it was like the frozen tundra nightmare season. And I was just like, I have to live here. This is just too good. I don't know why, but it really just like resonated in my heart, right? That cosmic resonance. I was like, I need to go there, right? But this is such a stressful period, right? Because it's like, you know, the money, the future, it all comes down to this. You better have the best audition of your life or you're gonna be homeless, right? Like this kind of like propaganda sinking in for sure. You know, and I bought into all this stuff. I bought into the idea that going to a top music school was an absolutely necessary part of my journey to jazz mastery. My thoughts have for sure changed on this now, and I would never advise anyone ever go to music school. They should just, you know, get a more reasonably priced education that's way more efficient. But I do understand, like, the value of networking in a music school. That is massive, although now we have the internet, and so you can actually just network, honestly, a lot more effective there. But in 2010, we didn't realize that the internet was like the keys to the kingdom of everything, right? We thought you have to go to physical locations to do networking. And that was part of the reason why I was like, yeah, I gotta go to McGill because Bob says that all the best musicians are at McGill, so I believe him, let's go. And for me, it turned out to be absolutely crucial. I mean, you're gonna see later in the story why McGill was a very, very important place that I be for uh, many years, actually. So I initially got waitlisted at McGill, right? Like, couldn't sleep, right? And you know, at the literal last second, actually the literal last second, McGill came through and offered me admission. And it was literally the same day that I was literally writing my email to accept Berkeley's offer. I was like, yeah, I guess I'm going to Berkeley. And I was like, this doesn't feel right, man. And then like, right, I'm about to press send on the email. It's like, oh, I got the email from McGill. Congratulations, you're going to McGill. I was like, wow. And that's the type of thing that kind of makes you believe in like destiny, honestly. <laughs> so now it's like, welcome to Montreal. <laughs> I'm still here. The first thing that happened when I got to Montreal in August 2010, I was asked by Luke Carey, okay, to join a band. Now, Luke was from Maine, right? Classic Mainers hooking up in Montreal, right? Luke went to high school at the same high school that Brandon Meager went to. So I actually knew Luke through Brandon and we actually did play in a rock band in Maine called Estimated Profits and made a sick record. Never forget Estimated Profits. So Luke was like, okay, like Blake and I are gonna like, you know, flip Montreal upside down, set the whole place on fire, right? 
and he was starting his second year as a neuroscience student, but like Luke was a great bass player. I knew he had a really great musical vision and I was like, yeah, man, like let's go. First, first band in Montreal, let's go. And so at first the band was just Luke and I bouncing ideas off of each other. Luke had a massive creative vision and he was convinced that this band that we were about to form was gonna become the next big thing. He did turn out to be right, at least in terms of like underground Montreal rock, which was at that point was absolutely thriving, like to levels that like are honestly unfathomable to to the post pandemic era so we got this guy cam bell on drums who was just like another guy you know around he was studying like medical science or something like that but literally brought his drum kit to montreal like so we knew he was pretty serious and so yeah we were like let's go cam and then right here right now is where professor keaton right the very same neil heaton who plays keyboard and piano on nautilus right this is where we first met. He was the keyboard player in this band and the four of us were Jade House. And we actually did end up being one of the most iconically legendary bands of that kind of like early 2010 scene in Montreal. It was quite a phenomenon, I must say. So Jade House was where I embraced my rock sensibilities and it was really the first time I applied my jazz knowledge to rock. And Professor Heaton was doing the same thing on keys. You know, we were both kind of applying that jazz awareness to rock and him and I together as two chordal instruments came up with some of the most like iconic ever really just you know applying our full knowledge and kind of bouncing ideas off each other it was a really really strong musical bond that the two of us developed because we were both kind of in that same mindset of like okay so we like rock but we have all this jazz knowledge so let's like see if we can like reinvent the game of rock and that's literally what we were trying to do so So Jade House raged on for the next three years. We recorded two albums and played a lot of shows. And honestly, it was it was super, super epic. Professor Heaton and I played in a, a lot of other bands together. One in particular was the equally legendary sort of like jazz rock quintet by Evan Shea, Redshift. <laughs> Get Redshift. These bands are all absolutely like definitive bands of that like early 2010 Montreal DIY underground scene. And we were breaking all the rules, right? Because we had Jade House with the rock band, we had Redshift with like the jazz rock band, and we were putting those two things together. And we were kind of showing everybody sort of like that underlying jazz mentality that sort of weaved all these bands together, right? And there's more bands, right? The other absolutely legendary full circle band was literally Idiot Band. <laughs> That featured Dom Spraga. Yep, surprise, Dom shows up in Montreal and becomes the bass player in Idiot Band. So Idiot Band was so heinous, it, it literally wasn't even fair. It was a quartet, Joel Payette on alto saxophone, Kyle Hutchins on drums, you know, me on guitar, Dom on bass. It was absolutely out of control. 
Uh, we were literally finalists in the legendarily iconic Jazz on Raphael contest, which is like a classic Montreal jazz contest where, you know, you can win like uh, money and support and grants and whatever. We didn't win, but we were finalists. And that means that we got to actually open for Shy Maestro. Uh, and that was pretty sick. I remember just being really proud that, you know, Jazz and Raphael had to put idiot band in big letters like all over downtown Montreal to celebrate that we were finalists. So Jade House, Redshift, Idiot Band, all absolutely incinerating Montreal between the years of 2010 and 2014. And I was able to take full advantage of McGill's recording facilities and made absolutely devastating records with all of those bands for literally free. It was the classic situation where the audio engineering students were looking to record the sick local bands and I literally had all the sick local bands. So the key audio engineer engineering student who recorded these bands was none other than Denis Martin. And that's the same Denis Martin who engineered the first two GSM albums. So we're getting there, be patient. We're getting to the GSM era. So after doing a ton of live playing with really interesting bands and doing a lot of recording and just getting a ton of experience between 2010 and 2014, I completed my jazz performance undergrad in 2014. And honestly, for various reasons, uh, Jade House Redshift and Idiot Band just kind of they just tapered off because people moved away, you know, they got jobs and, and whatnot, you know how it goes. So it's 2014, I'm in Montreal with an undergrad degree in jazz performance in no band. There's only one thing to do at a time like this, start a band. And that brings us to the gas station era. <laughs> So there was this bass player I knew from McGill and I would play with him a little bit in 2010 when I first got to Montreal. This guy was specifically an electric bass player who liked to play Coltrane solos on bass. And he laid down probably the deepest pocket of anyone I'd ever know, like straight up giving Dom Sprega a run for his money. <laughs> I literally just knew that this guy who played Coltrane solos on electric bass was the only option for a band that went by the name of Gas Station Mentality. And I thought of this name before I started the band. I had the concept for the band. I knew what I wanted the band to be. And that helped me to figure out the musicians that I needed to support that vision. So of course, now you know, we're talking about the absolutely iconic Antoine Pellegrin. Right? Something about his funk smelled like gasoline, and that's what I wanted. I wanted the gas station funk, the pungent odor of petrol. Antoine freaking Pellegrin was the guy. He knew all about the gas station funk from the moment I told him about the concept. He was like, yep, makes complete sense. Let's go. We want gas station funk. I'm down. Now, the other deep cut that was an obvious third member on drums was Guillaume Pelot. And I had played with Guillaume a lot through 2010, 2014 in a couple different bands, including Redshift. And Guillaume was just one of my first friends in Montreal and an absolute God tier master of drums. Like to this day now, like actually like Hall of Famer, Montreal jazz drummer, one of the best guys in the whole freaking business. So he was an obvious choice for GSM and that was the trio. Guillaume, Antoine, and Blake. After building and refining an absolutely devastating set over the course of one year with just the trio, I hit up Denis, right? Good old Denis Martin from McGill, and GSM entered the studio in May 2015 to record the first album, self-titled GSM. turned out so heinous that we were literally surprised. 
and to this day I can't even play like I did back then. The true GSM fans know what I'm talking about and appreciate that wild energy of the first album. It was basically like we were all just flying by the seat of our pants trying to fully comprehend the full scope of the gas station funk. So the turbo booster moment came for gas station a few months later when I entered GSM in the Montreal Jazz Fest Music Changes Lives competition. And we literally won the competition with this performance. And I got this guitar as the grand prize. So it was literally official. We were actually the sickest band ever at this point. Something important to note here was how winning that guitar actually caused a major shift in my musicality, right? So first of all, the prize for winning the competition was not specifically that guitar. It was just the opportunity to go in the St. Catherine Guitar Gallery here in Montreal and just literally pick any guitar in the collection to take home as my forever instrument. So that particular guitar called out to me because I knew I was moving in a more hard rock, edgier direction with GSM. And this guitar was just the perfect machine to get that job done. I could tell from the first moment I picked it up, but I did pick it up because it looked sick as hell also. Now I always say that guitar is like an exact combination of a Les Paul and a Stratocaster, like best of both worlds guitar. It's just way too good. I've never played a guitar that even comes close to the feel that I get on that guitar in terms of riffing, chording, soloing. It just does everything perfectly. And now it's such a deeply woven part of my musical identity that I really just don't have any desire to play any other guitars. So now that I had this priceless instrument in my possession, I felt like I needed to embrace my rock sensibilities. And this is where my love for Tool began in earnest, almost kind of out of nowhere. See, I was literally just checking out late 90s and early 2000s bands like Incubus and Linkin Park, right, to get inspiration for the next GSM album. And I just came across Lateralis, literally on YouTube, and it was just lights out. Okay, finally, like the soundtrack of my reality has been revealed. Tool fans understand what I'm talking about. When it cuts, it just cuts all the way deep. And that's exactly what Tool did to me. They just cut me all the way deep. Tool became my literal religion by this point, And I transcribed nearly all of their tunes and made actual scores of those tunes. And then I actually formed a band to play my Tool scores which ended up turning out to be a tribute band, which was like a decent source of income for a few years there leading up to the old uh, shutdown. So check it out. We had Evan Shea from Redshift on tenor sax and Joel Payette from Idiot Band on alto sax playing the vocal parts. <laughs> So the band was literally called Maynard because I thought it was like clever because there's no vocals. It's instrumental tool with two saxophones playing the melodies. That was Maynard. <laughs> Very, very iconic. And there's actually a couple of shows that happen where Maynard opened for gas station mentality. You can imagine what kind of show that was. On bass, we had Stefan Krims. On drums, we had Eric Mayette. It was just completely legendary. If you saw it, congratulations. You were one of the lucky ones. <laughs> So to me, this was just research, right? This was compositional research. Like I was studying Tool's music to prepare to write the second Gas Station Mentality album, right? So now with even more confidence by simply just doing the work and researching the music that I loved and actually playing the music and understanding all the idiosyncrasies of Tool and just seeing the way that they think about music, 
I was very confident and very prepared to write the second Gas Station Mentality album, and I knew it was gonna blow everything out of the water, and by everything I mean like literally everything. <laughs> So now I knew that I was going to be spending like the next potentially couple years writing that music, rehearsing it, playing live, refining it, right? And I thought to myself, man, what better place to write the second Gas Station Mentality album than literally McGill, right? With all the resources that they have, right? So I was like, I think I'm going to go for my master's degree. So sure enough, I applied for the master's jazz performance degree and uh, yeah, I ended up getting a full scholarship and that was pretty sick. So just two months after I started that master's degree in the fall of 2016, the next major pivot point occurred in my life. And that was seeing Meshuga live on Halloween in Montreal on the Violent Sleep of Reason tour. And I, to this day, that concert, I'm still tripping from it because it was kind of before Meshuga was playing like sort of like the larger venues that they're playing at now, they were still playing like kind of mid-sized venues and they were playing this venue called Metropolis here in Montreal. And honestly, it was just too perfect. It was just the right size. The sound was so flawless. That's why it was, it's the best concert I've ever seen in my life to this day, because it was just the combination of the venue and obviously just like the power of Meshuggah and their just full-blown performance mastery that just delivered the heaviest, hardest hitting concert. It just turbo boosts my awareness. I still get out of bed in the morning thinking about that concert. It was just that crystal clear sound. The backbeats were raging through and it was like we were at some kind of intergalactic rave party on Mercury. It was just way too crushing. The impact of that concert is evident in the work I've done as a composer and educator. Like I'm still using Meshuggah as sort of like my base layer compositional framework. And that whole Meshuggah phase was really just kicked off by that concert and seeing them live and just feeling the full impact of Meshuggah in that pretty small venue. Like, I am truly grateful for that experience. It, it was quite spectacular to say the absolute least. So, continuing on here. From the fall of 2016 to the spring of 2017, I was now composing music for the second GSM album while earning my master's degree with all this tool knowledge that I had actually, you know, from transcribing and actually performing. And then also now I'm starting to study the Meshuggah stuff and that's working its way into my playing and compositional awareness as well. So all of that is really informing that second GSM album. Now, during the whole time I'm doing my masters, GSM continued to rage through the live scene in Montreal. And it was really the live playing that solidified the music I was writing at the time. Cause you know, I was always writing with the live performance in mind. And that really just kind of comes from being a jazz musician at heart, right? Like I'm pushing the envelope of like riff based music, but I'm always thinking about like, are we gonna be able to execute this at the highest level on a live performance? And I really think that's just that jazz mentality, right? It's all about that live performance execution, right? <laughs> So one thing that happened in early 2017 was that GSM was getting some opportunities to play stateside, specifically in New York City. Uh, this caused some logistical issues as Antoine and Guillaume were Canadian and they couldn't work in the US without a permit. Obviously not a problem for me because I'm an American. So, you know, thinking that I really wanted to take advantage of some of these opportunities, I had to get creative. And this is a major, major pivot point for like the whole mentality of the gas station. Because I knew if I was gonna play stateside with GSM, at least in the phase that we were currently at, which was not like, you know, international superstars, right? Pretty much just a working class band here. It's like, okay, how are we gonna do this, right? I'm not gonna pay for a permit. How are we gonna do this? And I realized that the option was that I was gonna have to try to find some musicians in the United States who would be willing to take on the challenge of the gas station. Now, luckily, I did have a man on the inside that was my best friend, Eric Quinn, who was at the time in New York City, and he knew some great musicians there, and he knew the two guys. He knew the Americans who were ready for the gas station. He was like, yep, no, there, I, there's no questions. It's them. There's the, they're the only two options there are because they wear Meshuggah and Tool shirts. And I was like, oh, okay, perfect. And we're talking about Jono Stewart. <laughs> and 
Henry Buchanan Vaughn Absolute legends of the gas station took this whole thing to a whole new level because these two guys just crushed this music so violently. They brought their own voice to the music, which further expanded the vernacular of the music itself. See, Antoine and Guillaume had set such a strong precedent for the GSM style that Jono and Henry were able to completely understand what the music required, but obviously they're not Antoine and Guillaume and they're smart enough to know that they're not gonna just try to be like them. They're just gonna understand the music and bring their own voice to it. And that's really what being a great musician is all about. It's not about like playing exactly like somebody else to get a job done. It's actually more about just supporting the essence of the music, meaning the music can exist independent of the musicians performing it, right? And of course, Jono and Henry knew that because they were classic jazz mentality masters who had a full, complete, comprehensive understanding of jazz but also were like into Tool and Meshuggah and just tearing it up in New York playing in like rock bands also, right? So mentally, we were all on the exact same page. So obviously massive paradigm shift for GSM with just bringing in new musicians to play that music and it completely informed the protocols of the band later on when we started work on the third album. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. After playing some massive shows stateside with American GSM in February, 2017, gaining that critical insight into the first principles of the gas station by experiencing music with other musicians. I returned to Montreal with this newfound insight to complete my master's degree and record the album, Systematically Manufactured. In March, 2017. So we released that sucker in May 2017, literally at the exact moment that I completed my master's degree. Now, an important note for context is that during this whole period, literally from 2010 to 2017 and beyond, my bread and butter, like financially, was actually teaching jazz guitar and playing jazz, like background jazz, like a lounge lizard, like at cocktail parties or like restaurants. Literally from 2013 up until the pandemic, I was actually knocking down doors to get jazz gigs. And I did get some really great steady jazz gigs at this point. The gigs were always duo with none other than Dom Sprega, right? And we called ourselves the standard duo. Now these gigs were absolutely critical to my creative development because something happens when you're playing improvised music night after night for literal years on end. In an effort to keep yourself and your fellow musician engaged in the music, you force yourself to break out of stock licks, right? Because that's gonna be boring. You insist upon a more compositional approach to solo sections, you start to think bigger. And of course, my students understand this, but I'm not gonna get too far into that at this moment. The point is, is that all of the improvisation I was doing at those cocktail jazz gigs ultimately unlocked my compositional awareness. So the reason why Tool and Meshuggah resonated so deeply was because I could specifically see how their approach to music making was actually the same as mine, but just way more refined to the point where they're completely blurring the line between improvisation and composition on literally multiple levels. For those guys, everything ends up being composition at the end of the day because it's all about systematically capturing the best possible moments and developing your compositions and ultimately productions with that specific goal in mind. They can use improvisation to capture those moments, right? But it's really just another tool in the toolkit. So like use improvisation when it's helpful, but be prepared to write out and cement every last detail of the music that you're playing. And that's how you get the best of both worlds right there, right? That's how you get the jazz mentality to integrate into compositional music like rock, metal, you name it, and classical, like, right? Take that jazz comprehensive fluency, apply it on a compositional level, and you kind of end up with some tool Meshuggah type stuff, literally. So I was attempting to sort of do this on the jazz gigs, right? I was attempting to just kind of capture those good moments and approach my solos more like, you know, compositions. But, you know, I, I couldn't do it back then. I literally didn't have the tools that I needed. I didn't even understand 
how many layers of systems were being interwoven within the compositions of Tool and Meshuggah, right? So that's partly what inspired me to really study their music is like, I know something's going on here that I need to understand in order to get my awareness to that next level. So I studied their music to an extreme level. I was able to completely understand the frameworks that they're using. And then I was able to start applying them to my own improvisation and composition, right? And right there, what I just described is exactly what's being taught in my school systems for creation, like just applying the Tool Meshuggah frameworks to jazz harmony and obviously producing masterful compositions as a result, right? Okay, so back to the story, it's March, 2020 and all the gigs disappear, right? Lose every source of income instantly, right? So pretty obvious what needed to happen at that point, start writing the third GSM album, kid. Welcome to the cyclical antiquity era of GSM. So by March, 2020, I was more than halfway through Meshuggah Monday. I had been writing like a compulsive maniac the whole time I was transcribing and presenting those Meshuggah studies because the whole point of studying other people's music is to integrate what you learn into your own composition. So I literally had somewhere around like 44 demos of like my actual best compositions up to that point because I had been aggressively strengthening that compositional muscle by systematically integrating the new awareness that I had from Meshuggah and also Tool just into my own compositions on a literal weekly basis. So suffice to say, GSM had a lot of material to pick from when we started the process of making the third album in March, 2020. So quick side note, we did have a lineup change before we started work on the third album. Greg KT comes in to replace Guillaume and it just made too much sense. Everything was mutual. It was just perfect, right? So between March, 2020 and November, 2021, the trio, Antoine, Blake, Greg, grinded day in, day out, and arranged the new material that we were gonna record on this album as a unit. We were collectively composing and arranging this material. And this right here, I must highlight as one of the most formative and productive periods of creative work I have ever been a part of. The band was of one mind and we were more slick than a well-oiled machine and our ability to communicate highly complex ideas and systematically test all of those ideas in all of their variations. We got scary tight doing this, right? Like obviously preparing to record the album, but also composing this way. We, it was just like that psychic connection was full tilt, absolute maximum strength. And we did break all the rules to play a show in September, 2020. <laughs> legendary right because the support we got from the fans when it was literally like borderline illegal to leave your house not to mention there was a so-called deadly virus that was supposedly running rampant all through the planet at that exact moment those fans who showed up and literally jammed that place up dude no lie they inspired us to keep grinding and produce the best album imaginable, right? Because we already had the momentum from the work we were doing. We already had new material that we did perform at that particular show, and it just went absolutely freaking hard. <laughs> Oh, 
water I put it there. Did anybody put any fucked up shit in there? Good. And we knew from that show that we were actually about to embark on the most epic phase of GSM yet. So after that show, we continued to grind with that massive pandemic show inspiration in our hearts and minds. And by November, 2021, we were ready to hit the studio to record cyclical antiquity. Voiceless we approach you. So the recording of Cyclical Antiquity breaks down into three phases. Phase one was Trio in the studio laying the bedrock tracks. So the bedrock tracks are the things that we had been working on as a trio. And we knew that we were going to build on top of those bedrock arrangements. The first thing we needed to do was just lay them down and get those flawless performances that we knew we could achieve based on all the work we had done. So another side note, we did have a lineup change uh, for this recording session, Simon Petraki had now replaced Denis Martin on the console and just go listen to the album to see how that turned out. So we recorded the Bedrock tracks during the first week of November 2021 and we knew we had captured absolute dynamite gold, but we knew that was going to happen even before we got to the studio. So during the Bedrock sessions, we were already talking about the arrangements that would go on top of these Bedrock tracks. We already knew Benny was going to be on it. <laughs> And we knew like all the deep cuts from Montreal were gonna be on it. Like we were gonna arrange this thing well beyond what the previous two albums had been arranged. So once those bedrock tracks were complete, phase two was on and we were now producing and arranging on top of the bedrock. So. <laughs> We spent literally, literally all of 2022 and easily the first half of 2023 in this phase two of just arranging and producing. And we made absolute magic happen just through patience, focus, faith, and collaboration with some of the best musicians on the planet. I mean, literally go check the Systems for Creation podcast episode four to hear more about that process because it's, it's quite interesting. So phase three here, okay? So phase three is the final phase of this project and this was bringing the music to the live stage right so this presented so many logistical challenges because the way that we had produced the music we literally weren't thinking about live at all right and that's in contrast to what i was thinking about in the first two albums where i was very focused on you know how are we going to pull this off live well for cyclical antiquity i completely freed myself from that mentality and I was just like, well, let's just arrange the best album ever. Like, let's not worry about what's gonna happen live. In the back of my head, I knew we were gonna have to figure out a way to play it live at some point, but I wasn't worried about that during the process of composing. But what ended up happening was, you know, comes time to, you know, set up the release show. And it's like, okay, the only way we're gonna be able to actually pull this thing off live is if we bring in some serious backup, right? <laughs> So this is where my identity as a teacher of the jazz mentality really deeply solidified. And I had already been teaching jazz, but this whole thing takes it to a whole new level. So this is how this worked. How did we prepare for this live show, right? Well, first thing is I had to teach the music to the additional guitarists. And we had a total of four additional guitarists join us for that live performance. So he had one acoustic guitar that was actually playing all the songs. And then the rest of the songs were actually divided up among three guitarists. So there was four new people who were coming on board here. And all four of those people had to completely master this material to literally the highest possible level. So I had to show them all the way inside my mind to the point where they literally understood my exact thought process behind everything. 
and the quality of the performance was at stake here because in order for that performance to reach the highest level and meet the standard and exceed the standard ultimately of the gas station i needed all of those additional musicians to be absolutely completely fluent in the music beyond just like knowing what notes to play at the right time like literally understanding the frameworks that were integrated in these compositions and obviously i got the four best guys in the business right like i got like all true masters in their own right that's why i got them but that didn't mean deep work wasn't a requirement to get all of us to be on the same page but we did the work man and the performance speaks for itself it was literally ritualistic absolutely off the charts hugely critical detail is that none of the music had been written anywhere besides on my midi sequencer in logic and that really only covered the bare bones but that meant that all the music was learned orally right like you know by showing and teaching and listening right no sheet music like literally the way it used to be and i knew it had to be this way in order to get the best performance possible because no one could be looking at sheet music on stage that's just not an option like of course obviously right so everyone needed to be playing like directly from the heart and that's what we were able to achieve with good old-fashioned time focused and sound pedagogy <laughs> tradition being passed on right so that release show happened on november 22nd 2023 and a new paradigm was birthed right so you do see the final phase of creating cyclical antiquity required me to dig deep as a teacher and leader in order to communicate the deepest nuances in my own understanding and this is what gave me the confidence to take my teaching to the next level and start actually writing out curriculums and communicating the secrets of jazz to all of those who seek them. Systems for Creation is the result of my dedication to that high standard and my dedication to effective communication and spreading the secrets of jazz because honestly, they shouldn't really be secrets. It's just a way of thinking about music that unlocks your full creativity. That's what jazz is. It's not a style, it's a mentality. And I'm dedicated to teaching what I've learned through my experience, simply because of the way that it's uplifted my life. I live a beautiful life because music is essentially my religion and my spirituality. <laughs> derive a lot of peace from just understanding jazz at that fluent level right everyone who wants to go to the highest level of music and basically fully express themselves musically it's pretty much unavoidable that you're gonna need to understand the jazz mentality to do that that means you know like literal actual theory chord construction rhythmic frameworks just like the actual paradigm of rhythm itself, right? These are the things that the jazz musician understands. These are the things that like John Coltrane and Miles Davis were literally aware of when they're playing, right? And I believe the same thing is true for somebody like Danny Carey or Adam Jones. I feel that they are completely aware of all of these things that the jazz musician is aware of, but obviously you see the application is completely different and that's a beautiful thing. And that just really corroborates the idea that jazz is a mentality and it applies to all styles of music. I hope this kind of inspires you to follow your own path, right? Follow your own voice, learn music, for the sake of actualizing your creative vision. And there's no reason that you shouldn't hold yourself to the absolute highest standard. I'm living proof that the world is not too saturated for another musician. And that's because we all have unique voices as musicians. There's not gonna be anyone else like you. So from an objective perspective here, you have a better shot at growing your wealth as a musician than you do working a dead end job literally because they can replace you at a dead-end job they cannot replace your creative vision no one can replace it it's impossible and i started to become aware of that with gas station right i started to become aware of the fact that if i just pursued my own unique vision that's going to be the best investment that i can make in my future and here we are now 
I'm teaching, that allows me to continue to produce music and all of those things feed into each other and it's a beautiful life. So literally that's the picture of the modern jazz musician. You gotta do everything. You gotta be a jack of all trades. You've gotta teach, you've gotta write, you gotta teach how you write and you gotta continue to push your knowledge by studying music in the wild. So that's like, you know, studying your favorite music, extracting the frameworks that they use, and then kind of cross contaminate what you're learning that way with sort of like the fundamental jazz knowledge, which I think is critical for everyone. I'm talking about like understanding how to construct chords, understanding how to run rhythmic frameworks through chords, right? And this is, this is what we've been teaching. I've been talking about this stuff on my channel forever. So I hope this was a pivotal video for you. If you wanna work with me, you know how to do it, right? We got the school, we got systems for creation. I believe that's the best jazz curriculum available on the entire internet. So if you wanna learn jazz and you wanna do it fast and efficiently, check out System for Creation, take advantage of that dynamite curriculum. You can hit me up on Instagram and we can potentially talk about, you know, getting you a scholarship into the school. I'm still giving the lifetime access scholarship and I know that's pretty insane, right? Considering the monthly subscription is $369. So you probably want that lifetime access. So just hit me up on Instagram. We'll talk about it and we'll see if you're the right fit and we'll get you on the pursuit of greatness.